So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being present, being here in community with us. Um, I want to first begin by um, acknowledging that I, and actually we, are all guests on the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. My name is Tui Vaden, and I, along with Dr. Linda Ho Pache here, director of the Vietnamese in the Diaspora Digital Archive, are co-moderating this session titled Cultural Production and Archival Preservation. I'll talk a little bit about what that is and then pass it on to uh, this wonderful group of speakers. So I'm a professor of information studies. How many people know what information studies is in this room? Some of you, not too many, um, a vague idea. So I'm at UCLA where I teach in the graduate school and we train future librarians, archivists, and curators. So people who I like to describe as working in the glam industry. Galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, right? Really important cultural institutions. I like to think of it as where memory is preserved and where we draw our sense of who we are as a society, as a community, um, where we've been, in order to really kind of piece together where we're going. Um, so along with being a professor, I'm also an oral historian, an archivist, and an arts advocate based in Orange County, California, where I've had the pleasure of serving the Vietnamese American Arts and Letters Association with GISA for close to uh, 13 years or so. Um, but in my professional role at UCLA, I also co-direct the Community Archives Lab. And what that is, is we conduct research on and we train masters and PhD students to do what we call liberatory memory work, or work that repairs the harms done onto marginalized groups by centering their histories, building their own archives for political empowerment. So before this kind of newish role, because this is only my second year at UCLA, um, I was the curator for the University of California Irvine's Southeast Asian Archive, which documents the histories of populations from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And then before that role, I served as director of the Vietnamese American Oral History Project, um, which collected and preserved oral histories of Vietnamese Americans throughout Southern California it built upon the tremendous work of Go Jiu Yang, Nancy Bui, and of course Linda Ho Peche in this role now. Um, but we were gathering oral histories through training students to bridge the intergenerational divide by fostering a space where they could hear from their parents, their grandparents, aunts and uncles about their experiences coming to the United States. So I consider my oral history and archival work memory keeping and a means for pushing for narrative change in our community. I consider my work fundamentally political, actually. So I've been researching, teaching, and developing community archives to address the historical erasure of marginalized or min minoritized communities like ours. Yesterday's conversations in this room really inspired me to think about how so many of us here for many, many years, and even before I even came into the picture, We've been doing work towards these shared goals. I truly believe that whether you're doing it in the political arena or in the arts or in medicine, you're, you've been actively seeking to address the harms that have been done onto our communities because of silencing, erasure, um, distortions, and this history is a hard history, right? We know that it's incredibly vexed. Yesterday, An Thung Bu, began by sharing his own story of loss, his father burning their documents and memorabilia. And like the Honorable Joseph Gao, who shared through his mother's quote-unquote ordinary story, An Thung shared his story, he said, not to be sentimental, if I recall, but to make sense of his or perhaps our collective um, experiences of loss, grief, trauma, grit and resilience, and perseverance. But I want to respectfully uh, challenge this privileging of sense over sentiment. Um, I think that sentiment, or sometimes I call it affect, sometimes I call it emotion, or feelings, have an important place here. Feelings have an important place in our work in cultural production, right, Kenneth? Um, 
Feelings have an important place in the work we do, memory keeping, building archives. Sentiment, I think, is what makes us human, is what transforms archives from those cold, dark places where dust gather in stacks. When I say archives, or I say libraries, you're probably imagining that very thing, right? Um, traditionally, archives are built by those in positions of power. And in war, the winner takes it all. Not to, you know, just quote ABBA, but the winner gets to write history as they see it. What happens to the rest of us? So archives hold the records that validate the past, that serves as evidence of the past. They help a society remember. What are we without our memories? And what are the memories that Vietnamese Americans can live with? So yesterday, many people addressed the idea of reconciliation for Vietnamese Americans with Vietnam. I want to propose a different R word um, for us to consider today. Repair or reparations. What are ways that we can repair the harms done unto us through the systematic erasure of South Vietnam and refugee stories inside Vietnam and the distortions and silences of South Vietnam and refugee stories in America? We may not yet be able to reconcile with Vietnam, but we most certainly can do reparative work in every discipline or every field that we work in, from politics to medicine to arts and humanities. So the speakers today are going to share with you ways that they've done this type of work. These are speakers who have some significant insights um, into these big questions. Here we go. The big questions uh, regarding memory work are here, kind of to frame the conversation. Um, I'm going to pass it on to my co-moderator, Linda Ho Pache, but also invoke all of us to think about this in the ways that we do work for our community. Um, and I look forward to the conversation that we'll have after everyone has a chance to share. Hi, good morning. Yesterday, I came from Houston, Texas. It was 89, and I don't know what to do with this 29-degree weather. I'm an independent scholar and cultural anthropologist, uh, currently living in Houston. Um, I am the co-editor of Toward a Framework for Vietnamese American Studies, published by Temple um, University Press, along with uh, Duong Vu and Alex Tai Vo and um, have been really thinking through uh, this morning's panels and yesterday's panels and really thinking through representation as um, sort of an underlying theme in all of our work. And uh, in public education, Joseph, your work, that was really inspiring, and in the political sphere as well. And in this panel, as um, Thuy was mentioning, we're gonna hear from the work of scholars in other disciplines, art history, the classics, uh, community museums, and every other sphere in which we can think about representation. And I'm coming from Texas um, during this time, and uh, it's a particularly difficult time for us. Um, my uh, local school board has been taken over by the state of Texas. There are uh, book bans um, instated throughout the state. Uh, so really worried about what, what my children um, really are uh, going to get out of a public education system that is uh, trying to dismantle sort of the um, ethnic um, uh, community histories and um, our, our uh, place in American society in general. And I'm inspired by what's happening in California. I think it's in, important. Unfortunately, we, we can't all live in California. And uh, we're fighting some really significant fights um, outside um, that I'd like to um, make visible uh, through this talk. And in, in particular, the importance of resources and access. So what, one thing that's been happening in public school libraries is that um, they are dismantling the libraries at the schools um, that are struggling. And that might, may not be the schools that our communities, um, Asian or Asian American communities, are at. These are black and brown schools. But this is um, a call to really think about what's going on in, in a broader spectrum, because it could come to touch sort of all um, 
public education in the United States. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is just talk about in our uh, small corner in Texas what work we've been doing to, um, in the context of providing resources and access to resources, perhaps as a starting point to think about how we can all share um, in all the work that we do across state lines and across na uh, national lines and transnational work and advocacy and um, political work and museum work. Um, and I'm gonna start with just telling the story of how the Vietnamese and the Diaspora Digital Archive came to be. And this is um, a story that begins um, 15 years ago, over 15 years ago, in a university classroom. And um, I, I began with teaching a Vietnamese American Studies course at the University of Texas at Austin. This is back in 2008. And I thought my students would get a lot out of um, interviewing local community members in Austin, Texas. And so between 2008 and 2010, um, my students interviewed local uh, folks that Nancy Bowie from the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation put us in touch with. And this um, we also did at Rice University at the Center for Asian Studies there from 2013 to 2015. And they explored very broad topics. These were um, students that were not necessarily ethnic studies students. These were, from, um, they came from different experiences, different places, um, lived in different places in the United States. And they covered broad topics such as um, experiences during the war, their lives as refugees, starting in a new country. Then they produced course papers and museum exhibits that were often displayed in local history institutions. So this was um, the Austin History Center, the Texas State History Museum, as well as on campus. So we did have an opportunity to come and, ta um, and talk more deeply with the community then. And then in 2010, the Union of North American Vietnamese Student Associations raised over $60,000 for a Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation to conduct oral histories nationwide. And they used the oral history guide that we produced for the university classes to train volunteers to conduct those interviews with community members. So that was um, a special community project that uh, reached nationwide. And then institutions such as the Rice University Special Collections and the Southeast Asian Archives at the University of California at Irvine began to accession these, provide online access to some of these inter interviews. And so by 2017, um, the VAHF had amassed a pretty impressive international collection. By that time, Nancy had been all over the world, um, met all kinds of people, and um, we began to document them through this platform called Omeka, an open source web publishing system. And so it was important for me to make sure that we didn't lose the metadata, which is the who, the how, what were the circumstances of these interviews. And um, so these are archived that way in um, the Dublin Core Schema. So these are accessible online and, the, and sort of became the Vietnamese and the Diaspora Digital Archive with the idea that the collection would expand over time to include interviews across the global diaspora. So we've got right now about 250 Vietnamese language and 100 English language oral histories. They're about one to two hours each and about 30 are interviews with historians providing historical context. And so the interviews are hosted on YouTube this provides yet another avenue for public-facing accessibility. Thank you, Joseph, for all the work um, that you've helped um, in terms of making the um, translations and transcriptions available online. The, it, we could argue that this is the more successful front-facing um, uh, platform. It's amassed over 49,000 subscribers. They've got five million hours of unique viewing. So clearly people are listening, they want, um, to hear what people are saying, um, you know, now 10, 15 years later, continue to engage with this archive of, you know, what started off as a classroom project. And the project continues to collaborate with institutes of higher learning in order to provide translations, transcriptions, academic resources, uh, the oral history guide, a syllabus based on our pub published volume. And um, this is 
This has been done with support from the Global Studies Institute here at University of Oregon. Uh, but we continue to try to find funding that would continue this kind of work, this archiving work. Um, my colleague here, Kun Tran, also um, uh, continued to add materials. We um, have the ability to create online exhibits. One of them, for example, is a section that documents Boat People Memorials. And she's done great work and published um, amazing um, articles about what, uh, what memorializing means in the community. And so we hope that this can continue to expand to include other grassroots digital repositories that may not have the funds, for example, to continue a web presence. Uh, we've talked to folks from the Archive of Vietnamese Boat People in Australia, for example, and other uh, communities across the globe that are doing work. And the latest collection that we've uploaded includes documents and interviews relating to nonprofit advocates working with communities affected by the negative environmental impacts of a multinational corporation. This transnational multiracial coalition of advocates from Taiwan, China, Vietnam, and the US um, in Texas, Louisiana, and California, shed light on the importance of global alliances of people who are informed, engaged, and committed to the health of local communities. And so we're excited to feature the work of Vietnamese advocacy inside and outside of the diasporic homeland. So in sum, uh, the purpose of VIDA is to provide primary sources and interpretive materials for academic research, university instruction and community organizations interested in conducting their own oral history and archival projects. And I've heard a lot of folks talk about their own oral history narratives. And my dream is to be able to know uh, where all of this is and where my students can access these oral histories, um, the, these research projects, class projects, institutional projects, um, in order to grow our networking and collaboration. And so the values that guide this project are collaboration between grassroots organizations and academic archival institutions, accessibility, so we really take great efforts on translation and transcription, and inclusivity, the idea that Vietnamese diasporic communities do not live in a vacuum, and that we should continue to give thought to defining who we are just beyond our particular focus. Um, in other words, by focusing on visibility, who might we be dismissing or rendering invisible from this process? So um, I'd like to conclude with this thought, and that's the act of archiving. So making, uh, documenting, making official, making visible, making relevant, making accessible is often about the past, but it's foremost mostly about our present and what we think is important today. So that should guide what how we work and in what ways we work. And so we are curators, we're not objective collectors. As archivists, and this includes those of us that do it as academics, as teachers, as volunteers, civic leaders, we have a responsibility to make clear at each point of our archi archival process what our purpose is. So for me, archiving is not an end of, in, of itself, but a purposeful endeavor, and it can become a fruitful start of important conversations about visibility, belonging, and our uh, common humanity. So thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Thuy Tran, and she is an art historian cur curator, a PhD candidate at UCSB. Good morning, everybody. Um, what a pleasure to, it is to be here among movers and shakers in our communities, um, talking about what to look forward to going you know, from here you know, t into the next generations, in the next 50 years. And I wanna thank um, An Tung Vu to, who brought up, you know, my ears perked up when he talked about disconnected images from his, mo his memory uh, from childhood and the trauma of watching the destruction of things that his family worked so hard to build and, um, and stand for. You know, the erasure of the flag, for instance. Um, and it is a time for us to reclaim our place in history, to bridge the gap that has been missing from um, our, all of our, child, our childhoods. I think our, most of my colleagues um, here on this panel, uh, we are like the 1.5 generation. And um, so this story is sentimental for me. Um, this, my work is sentimental. Um, you know, it is a kind of reparative work. But overall, um, we're not just 
pre preserving memory. We're not just collecting oral histories, we're also culturally, uh, we are producers. We are continuing a tradition and we need to understand, of course, where we came from, um, but then how do we go from here to create? Because that is how we can endure. Um, and um, from yesterday's panels, um, I, heard, I heard a lot about, you know, are we Vietnamese, are we American, the, the fear of Americanization and the loss of roots. Um, but I want to champion and state that actually we're Vietnamese American and there is a hyphenated, uh, a hyphen in between that we can grow and build as a, a new kind of culture. Uh, the diasporic culture is different than the culture in Vietnam. It is different than, um, you know, a, there is a place for Asian American studies. There is a place for ethnic studies. Um, we have a particular history that we can really thrive and build from. You know, so, so I don't see too much of a fear for the next generation of, you know, we don't have to decide. We can be that in between and grow and, and really flourish um, in that place. Um, and my position as an art historian, um, let's see, what, what's up here? Oh, it's here. Um, so, um, and I have to stand here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, I thought I would start with a little bit of sentimentality. Um, this is an image of me when uh, I'm sitting on a lambretta, you know, and um, not really knowing what's going on. I was born after the war in Vietnam, and um, we, we left when I was four. And um, so, you know, Vietnam to me is, is through my parents' memories. And um, I always was curious to know what was my parents' life? You know, what was, what was that life like? What did I miss out on? You know, the, the young people now, we call it FOMO, right? I had serious FOMO. I'm like, what, would Viet, you know, what was Vietnam like? What was that like? What was it like to celebrate that Chung Thu? You know, the, the Long Dang is so beautiful, like, but I don't know much about it. Um, and so, you know, I just, it, this is also a plea to our community to nourish you know, these stories, but also to allow our younger folks to pursue careers in art history, in the arts. Because if we don't have the cultural producers, the creatives, and we don't nurture them, and we don't create a space for them, you know, like Vala has for our community in Orange County and ab abroad, you know, how, how can we continue that tradition? How can we continue our place, you know, um, in history? So, so it's important to nurture that. So I wanted to say the most important things first before I go um, on. And so, um, you know, just in the spirit of being transparent, you know, that's why I wanted to tell you what, what was my motivations to go into art history, although it wasn't the beginning, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to college thinking, oh, I'm gonna be an art history major. I had no idea what it was. I was pre-med, you know, I was gung-ho about math and science. Um, but I, it blew my mind how much we can preserve and understand another culture through material remains, um, through ancient artworks, through the visual uh, history. And so art history is learning about history but using artworks, and as Isa has said yesterday, you know, art spaces are places where we can really connect um, and reach out to our gen younger generations and to each other, uh, me to you, uh, one individual to another, and, um, and have a safe space, a creative space to exchange ideas. Um, and so, you know, just talking more about my generation, these are the artists, oops, um, these are the artists that I admire. Um, here you're seeing um, Din Kule, some of you might have might know. Um, yesterday, Isa showed us um, Tian Fong's works. Um, but these are stories that are about memory too. Um, but they are coming from a new, you know, it's, it's not literature, it's not poetry, it's not music, um, but it is through the visual arts, and I feel like the visual arts has still has yet to be um, fully supported in our community across the diaspora. I feel that's an area that we really could really build more on. I think it's wonderful that we have our music coming through Paris by Night and our performing arts, um, our theatrical, you know, th these things coming through through Paris by Night in Asia, but then what about 
the artists. Um, and so here, you know, Din Kiu Lei, for instance, has gone back to Vietnam to start um, Sang Art, which was the very first independent art space in Vietnam to showcase contemporary artists. Um, and here, um, Bin Yen, who is, you know, also looking at memory. And so, you know, it is not a, it's, it's not so much an oral history, it is a visual history and a way to connect those images that An Tung mentioned in his mind, um, you know, in Vietnam. And so in these ways, we are trying to connect those memories, but doing it in a very poetic, visually poetic way. Um, and in reference to that, you know, in my part, my part is I have been thinking a lot about um, what, what can I do as an art historian, my position as an educator? I'm currently teaching um, four courses, four college courses in art history. One of them uh, I have the pleasure of teaching is Survey of Asian Art. And within that course, which I teach at Golden West College, uh, it has a very large Vietnamese American student population. And so I took that opportunity and I've been, been encouraged by the chair of my department to incorporate a lot of Vietnamese art into it. And so it is a great pleasure for me to have a captive audience, you know, of students, uh, whether they like it or not. But actually, many of my students are saying that they are so grateful to be able to enjoy you know, a, a Dong Sung bronze drum, you know, to really understand the context of it, the history of it, and to explore their roots all the way to ancient times in Vietnam. And that's something I wish I had when I was taking art history, because most of the professors that I had were all white, privileged, uh, who were teaching Asian art. I'm like, where are the Asians who are, like, it's, Asian art, but you know te the professors teaching Korean art, Japanese, Chinese, and and those those three thing three countries are East Asian art. But what about Southeast Asia? What about Vietnam? You know, so so I found I I saw a place there. There was a void of our voices in the arts um, going through my studies, and so. So that's, that's where my work has been. Um, I'm, edu I'm an educator. I teach at col colleges level, um, but also I am a curator. Um, so this is a, an exhibition that I did a while ago for Vala, Marvelous Metaphors, and we have one of our artists in here. Um, the, other, the more recent exhibition I did is Yellow Submarine Rising, which also speaks to the anti-Asian um, you know, rise of anti-Asian hate crimes in the U.S. since the pandemic. And, and so Vietnamese American artists need to also be a collaborative force within the wider, you know, network of Asian American artists because there is a unique Asian American experience that we all also share. Um, and so these, these are spaces, again, once again, where we can really gather and cause you know, and create connections. Um, and so I'm a big, I'm a big, you know, alphabet person. So yesterday I was talking about the letter R, resilience and, reconcil you know, re reconciliation and resistance. And, and today I'm going to introduce to you um, the letter E. Um, and so just four E's to remember is that we have to create spaces um, in order to have those experiences that are shared in a commonality of visual spaces and creative spaces. It's a safe space. The uh, second E is to engage in dialogue in that opportunity. And then the third E is to embrace. Um, that's how we are able to reach across and um, understand each other. And then the fourth E is um, how we can enjoy you know, finally, can we enjoy our culture, to be proud of it, to reclaim our place, um, and in my field, the, the, our place in art history? So, um, so that's um, all of my alphabets for, <laughs> for you. <laughs> this, um, and, you know, so thank you very much for listening. I know I'm out of time. Okay. Thank you so much, Tui. Um, also funny to say my name to another person. Um, whoops, not the right one, sorry. So our next uh, speaker is Dr. Kelly Nguyen, who is an assistant professor of classics at UCLA. Um, Kelly, come on up. 
As you can all, uh, you probably are all noticing, I'm trying to be a very hardcore moderator and keep everyone on time because the conversations that follow are so wonderful and productive. So we want to make sure we have time for that. Clicker, you got it? I got the clicker. I got it. Don't start the time yet. <gasps> okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, very honored to be here, and of course. Um, you're all probably wondering, well, what is a professor of classics doing at this conference? Classics, the study of ancient Greek and Roman antiquity, right? It's a big elephant in the room. A lot of folks have already approached me asking, what? <laughs> so here, I'm, I'm here to answer that, and I'm here to tell you my, about my personal background and how it ties in with my academic ba background and how that led me to my current projects. And so my background in classics begins in college. Uh, I did not know what I wanted to major in, and I took some classes in archaeology because uh, I was drawn to it, uh, because you could use science, technology, the humanities to explore these questions that were interesting to me. Right? Um, and so I became interested in Roman archaeology specifically, and I was interested, uh, oh, I can use the clicker, I was interested in the Roman Empire, which was this vast empire that expands from the UK to North Africa to Saudi Arabia, and I've been fortunate enough to excavate across the Roman Empire from England uh, to Jordan and even in Italy itself, and I've I found that I was interested in these histories of empire, forced displacements, identity making. How did this great empire incorporate all the different peoples that it conquered, right? How did the people resist cultural assimilation? And if so, how did they do it? And what happened to the refugees that were created from those wars of imperial conquest? And how are refugees treated and portrayed in the ancient world? And I didn't realize that I was asking these questions because I was curious about my own history and about my histories of my, uh, of my ancestors, right? And so I, as I decided to pursue this discipline further and began graduate school, I experienced a lot of racism and misogyny from academics, um, from fellow grad students to faculty members, because classics is a very white field and a very privileged field. For you to even know what the classics is, right, it is to already be exposed to a very um, privileged space. Uh, and so my place in the field was always questioned because someone like me, Vietnamese, a woman, a refugee, study, to study a history that supposedly was not mine um, begs the question of, well, what are the limits of academic pursuit for Vietnamese people? And on top of that, I was forced to read Jonathan Shea's uh, Achilles in Vietnam. And Achilles in Vietnam is this is uh, Jonathan Shea is a psychiatrist, and he uses the Homeric poetry, the Iliad, and the Odyssey to help American veterans from the Vietnam War process their um, post-traumatic stress um, syndrome, right? Their P PT disorder, uh, PTSD. Um, and from this, there were no Vietnamese perspectives throughout the work. Vietnamese people were only referred to by um, slurs, and there were, and you can really, um, it really sums it all up in this whole denial of Vietnamese ex existence, especially from South Vietnam, is summed up in the index of Achilles in Vietnam, where you can see here, um, there's no gloss for Viet Vietnamese, Vietnamese people, it's just Viet Cong, and it sees, says, see enemy Vietnamese, right? And so there was this, this erasure, this deliberate forgetting that was happening even within the field of classics, right? From academic works to my own position in the field. And there was, this became a bigger problem because it inspired a whole subfield in classics that explored the combat trauma of soldiers in the West through the classics that replicated this kind of deliberate forgetting. And just to share another example, this is Lawrence Tridel's um, From Milos to Milai. Uh, and here, Tridel acknowledges the failings of the American campaign and the racism of American soldiers, but he's not engaged with Vietnamese materials or perspectives. There's a few brief references throughout the works. There's a quote from Anin Sorrels of War in his introduction. There's two footnotes to Lele um, Hayslip's novel, When Heaven and Earth Changed Places. 
Uh, and he has a brief mention of um, Jiang Bang uh, Duyen, a notable attorney and a political figure of South Vietnam. And try to, when he references uh, Jiang Bang Duyen, he, he comments on the laziness of South Vietnamese army, right? You can see the first quote here, um, where he talks about his worries about the growing influence of the Americans, and how that, those worries have a Mandarin air to them and seem not to recognize that in many cases, South Vietnamese armed forces were not willing to stand up to their Viet Cong opponents. And then the next quote is from his introduction of his monograph where he describes his deployment to Vietnam. And he says the South Vietnamese were not particularly keen on dying for the, their country. And this caused him to adopt their laissez-faire attitude, thinking that if dying for their country meant little to them, it meant even less to him. Right? And so you see other quotes here about how Vietnamese um, were ha too happy to let Americans do the fighting and that they, were, they lacked the heroism and obedience to a cause. Right? And these negative portrayals of the Southern Army reifies this damaging stereotypes that we've already been talking about in this, uh, in throughout this conference that circulated within and beyond the American Army. And it also contributes to the erasure of Arvin within public memory and within um, public imagination, especially in the West and uh, as well as in Vietnam itself. And so this is, has become especially problematic because the Republic of Vietnam um, since, the, uh, since you know, the Republic of Vietnam and Arvin has been um, presented as the puppets of American imperialism, what um, the U was just talking about in the, the intro um, yesterday, right? And how, how the, uh, that memory of the Republic of Vietnam and of Arvin have been defaced, memorials have been demolished, including cemeteries. We've also talked about this. And so this just further adds to it from this very small corner of academia and classics. Somehow it's permeated even there, right? But I knew that the classics was also a part of our history because of French colonialism. Um, and then this is partially because my grandfather was the only one in my family who knew what I was studying and was excited about it. And so there's a picture of him you can see in the middle. Um, and as you can imagine, I did my undergrad at Stanford. My family was so excited for me to go to Stanford and was so disappointed when I said I'm going to major in archaeology and the classics. If you thought majoring in English, a language that 1.5 billion people speak was bad, try majoring in dead languages, right? Uh, and my parents didn't graduate from high school. My grandpa was educated in the French uh, colonial system, right? And, and it, what was placed on me was that I came over to the US really young, and I've always been told we had mandarins in our family. And this was our chance, uh, because of my academic achievements, to create a new legacy in the education sphere in the US. Right? And I've always been told this. Um, and, and that's a lot to place on a child. Uh, but I was like, yes, I will take on this, uh, this call. But as you know, Jacqueline was talking about, no amount of academic achievement can help heal trauma. Um, and so my grandfather, though, to return to him, he was educated in this French system under colonial times, which had placed an emphasis on learning the classics. Uh, and this was an important part of the French imperial narrative. This time, European empires were in competition with each other, and one way that they were trying to do that, they, they tried to justify their power, was by claiming that they were the rightful heirs right, of the classical world, of the um, Roman Empire, that they, because they were the heir, they had a right to conquer the world. And so the French crafted this narrative and they, that they inherited this classical tradition, and that since ancient Greece and Roman world was the apex of civilization, that they, the French, had the duty to civilize the world, right? And this is la mission civilisatrice. Uh, and the classics uh, was then made into this foundation of Western civilization as this privileged inheritance of white Western culture. But, and so because of this, I thought there must be a whole generation, right, that of my grandfathers who were educated in the system and must have been engaged with the classics in these complex ways. For example, my grandfather, even though he was educated in the French uh, system, he joined the Viet Minh and fought against the French. And because of that, the French came to our house uh, in Hanoi and killed three generations of men. 
And at the same time, throughout my life, my grandfather preferred to speak to me in French. And, we be, and when he became deaf, we still were pen pals in French because that was how he best could express his intellectual, identity, intellectual ideas, right? Um, and so what, my, what led then to was, was my current book project of how classics was used by French and American empires to subjugate Vietnam and how Vietnamese people used the classics in turn to fight for different versions of liberation, right? Um, and this is a common theme, I think, of this panel too, this, this memory work for liberation. And the project spans from the colonial period to the post-colonial period, from Vietnam to the diaspora. And I'm looking at cultural productions from the works of um, Pham Quyen, of Nguyen Mạnh Tường, of Nguyen Phang Lam, Li Thu Ho, to those of present day Ocean Vuong, Linda Le, Vi Ki Nao, Viet Thanh Nguyen, and Quan Berry. And classics is the thread to think about the history of Western imperialism and neo-imperialism in Vietnam. And my goal is that you know, the classics doesn't belong to um, to anyone, not to the West, not to white Euro-Americans, Euro and that the history of the classic needs to include Vietnamese voices to reckon with the role of the classics, of the role that it's played in these violent societal structures like colonialism, imperialism, and white supremacy. And the classics is still being appropriated by white supremacists um, just recently at the January 6th insurrection, right? White supremacists were dressed up like the Spartans, like Roman soldiers, um, and made Trump their Julius Caesar, right? I've received death threats, even though this is a very particular subject. A very, I, I know that this is super niche, right? I'm interested in it. How many other people are interested in this? White supremacists, somehow they found me and they have sent me emails. Um, for example, I had one person say, we should have killed you all back in the war. Right, because they are threatened by the fact that I am um, exploding this idea that the classics belongs to some sort of white Western civilization culture. Right, so I just want to implore that we can teach our, teach our history, our literature, cultural production in departments that are traditionally seen as white, as Western. We can diversify and decolonize those fields and classrooms. And I teach a lot of comparative classes where students um, read Homer's Odyssey alongside, for example, Nguyen Yu's um, Juin Kiu and Ocean Vuong's poetry. I've had students engage with different cultural productions by folks in this room. Um, so for example, I've had students listen to Kenneth Nguyen's um, the Vietnamese podcast episode with Ocean um, I've had them look at sculptures from ancient Greece and Rome and compare them with those of Vietnamese boat people memorial. And so, of course, they, I turned to the Vietnamese in the diaspora um, archive. And, and so I just want to say knowledge is knowledge and should not be limited to borders and boundaries. And we should introduce students to history of Vietnam and Viet Vietnamese people and also expand what they think of as classics. Just give you an example of the influence that this can make, right? Of uses it, using um, the privilege that classics has had as a platform to teach Vietnamese history and literature and even art history, right? Is at the beginning of one of my classes, I asked students, um, what comes to mind when you think of classics? And so you can see here things, right? Like um, old stuff, foundational, um, and then you see whiteness, right? And then at the end of my class, I asked them again, and this is what they, they came up with. You can see that there's reclamation, regaining, retelling more R words that we can replace, right? Um, and so the, I'm not going to get into the rest of the, um, of, of how my project has expanded, um, because that's going to, Anjo Tui is going to talk a lot about how um, some of the overlap between his work and my work. But I've expanded that to think about not just leveraging my position as a professor at a university with institutional resources, so not just using the classics and the platform that it has had, but how do I use the institution's platform? So some of the things I've been doing is working with the Viet Museum in San Jose and digitizing their archives. And so this is an online exhibit that you can check out. Um, and I'm hoping to also expand this to think about um, ultimately what about those folks who don't have um, a museum? What about folks who have materials that they don't want to give up and that they don't want to donate a museum? So I'm thinking about um, you know this more post-custodial digital archiving work where we can digitize materials from the community and then give it back to them, right? But then the, there's a space where students can access um, this material um, and so this, just to end, because Tui is um, angrily showing me the stop sign, <laughs> is that 
I just want to really stress the importance of telling our stories to not only teach each other um, and, and, to, and not just tell our stories to each other and to other people, but alongside other people. Right? The importance of positioning our stories and our histories and our memories comparatively across time and space and not have borders um, stop us from sharing our stories in that way. Thank you. Not angrily, not angrily, but lovingly. Um, I could listen to Kelly and my colleagues talk forever. But to move things along, I uh, would like to introduce our final speaker on this panel. Um, and Jotui, I see two slides. I'm just going to open this one if that's OK. Whoops. Let me just introduce you real quick. So Anjo Thuy is the founding president of the Vietnamese American Heritage Museum based in Orange County, California. And let me go back up to your slide number one. Good morning, everyone. One early morning in February 1980, I finally set foot on the shore of Lam Sing refugee Thailand as a free man. Almost one million people, Vietnamese people, did not make it, but I survived. And I knew that I have a duty to make a difference. I pledged to myself that I would live as a good person and try to do meaningful, meaningful things for my community. It just happened this morning that I found the caravan stand right there, here. Stay at the same time with me in Lam Sing refugee camp in Thailand in 1980. Allow me to present Vietnamese Heritage Museum, VHCM. Founded in 2016, the Vietnamese Heritage Museum, VHCM, have a noble mission to safeguard the culture, history, and heritage of Vietnamese refugees and individuals for the benefit of generations to come. With this successful initiative, VSM is constructing a fairness asset for both current and future generations of Vietnamese individuals, enabling them to explore their, explore their origin and attend more profile graph of their identity. Furthermore, VHCM and Dural contribute to fostering an appreciation of the distinctive history, culture, and heritage of the Vietnamese American and the Vietnamese people among diverse communities around the world. VSM active, act actively share and offer essential information online, allowing individuals in Vietnam to contrast with the information they have been exposed to propaganda, ultimately enhancing their comprehension of contemporary of Vietnamese history. We hold the belief that through this initiative, VSM will power individuals to gain more impartial and truthful perspective on the past, present, and future. Let's now address the first question. How do Vietnamese Americans remember the war and commemorate the war dead? Our approach to paying tribute to the past and inspiring future generation lie in the presentation and historical artifacts. Each artifact carries the unique narrative within our museum. The most significant artifact stand tall, an authentic boat that served as a vessel for those in search for freedom from Vietnam. These remarkable artifacts offer visitors to immersive and Genuine 
children uh, experience providing them with a profound insight into the indomitable human spirit resilient in the face of adversity. The sealess resilience and fortitude of the human spirit continue to as towers. A young woman once shared how her mother survived story. Deeply impacted her, despite hearing his countless time. It's one only when she lay eye on the boat herself that she fully grabbed the narrative of her daughter to serve as a testament to the enduring power of the hope and the lasting legacy of human experience. Additionally, we safeguard history by correcting human negative and firsthand recollecting and compassing the post-war ordeal. Although confined the concentration camp and those who embark on Paris journey as a people, as a boat people, VSM effectively document the profound life lesson and experiences of individuals who persevere through some of the most challenging epic in history. You probably recognize the person on the picture on, the, on my left, she's right here. Yep, Miss Thank you. she's the woman who stay in the refugee camp for the most, I mean the education camp for the most of her time. So the wisdom of encounter, the crisis imparted to us, holding immeasurable worth, and we bequeath to the opportunity for the betterment. The younger generation have listened to their witnesses, then evolve into witnesses themselves, ensuring that this important story endure. Thanks to the individual endeavor that we succeeded not only the, in documenting the survivor account, but also in translating them into the book that narrow their life story in both Vietnamese and English. During our la recent gala, we have the honor to present this book to the survivor family. The profound impact of our work become evident that granddaughter for the very first time, comprehended the truly value, the, the tremendous hardship her grandmother had endured. Her tear bore witness, the potency at the presenting of the collective history and underscored the significance of transmitting them to forthcoming generation. about the commemor commemorating the war dead. At per United Nations High Commission for Refugees, it is approximate that a, tr a tragic toll 200,000 to 400,000 both people lost their life at sea while striving for freedom but never reached their destination. According to the document academic research, in the United States and Europe, an estimate 165,000 servicemen and women from the Republic of Vietnam, Paris. We, the Vietnamese diaspora, perpetually commemorate the memory of those victims who met their fate in the communist concentration camp, commonly referred to as free education camp. Numerous individuals lost their life without receiving the recognition they deserve. The sacrifice made by those who perish shall forever remain etched in our collection memory. And their value continue to serve at the wellspring of inspiration. We pay homage to their courage and enduring determination to pursue a brighter future, we serve as a poignant reminder 
to cherish the freedom we enjoy today. We pledge to eternally uphold their courage and honor the legacy they left behind. VSM has instituted two commemorative war that present an innovative approach to recollecting and instructing both the past. This war stands for poignant tribute to the multitude of the boat people who tragically perished while seeking freedom among with the 165,000 Vietnamese citizens who lost their life in the concentration camp for supporting the previous government. The digital war represents the remarkable for meaningful revenue the participating in the online commemorative exception initiative allow individuals from across the globe to delve to the story and destiny of the victim of the Vietnamese communist regime. By searching the name, we can review their photograph and gain insight into their life. It serves as a platform that empowers everyone to pay homage and to recall those who endure hardship during the challenging area. Why are we preserving the memory and culture important to Vietnamese Americans? Preserving and examining the transparency of the Vietnamese history stand at imperative task enabling the forthcoming generation to grab the sacrifice made by South Vietnamese individuals and fought for the democracy. Bringing our history and culture into the mainstream of the utmost significance, a value approach to the achieving this is to the utilization and of digital education resources. Notably, the California Education Department had acknowledged the Vietnamese Heritage Museum as an education access among 18 other museums in California. Presently, VSM is engaged in partnership with the Orange County Department of Education, extend to them access to our education material. One of the questions is how are they working to make this work sustainable and accessible? The museum vision involved in around making Vietnamese history readily available to both individual and global population. Hence, it is imperative that we adapt digital transformation measures, such as the digital archive, to an online database, auditor can gain more only a comprehensive insight into the artifacts, but also access multimedia content and compassing text, video, relevant information, and a multitude of other resources. In conclusion, numerous historians had author account of the Vietnam War, each bring forth distinct perspective on the war, but yet have aimed to encompass the full transparency of the Republic of Vietnam. Our organization is steadfast in its mission to amass and safeguard historical document, enable the historian to craft more impersonal negative and elucidate the history of South Vietnam. This concludes the valor at the South Vietnamese Army and the sacrifice made by those in the South during the conflict with the Vietnamese communism. After 48 years, the time had come for the public to accept the history that marked by transparency and to process education resources suitable for instructing future generations. Consequently, VSM had dedicated itself to com compilation of auth authentic historical records and artifacts intended to serve as a guide for forthcoming generations of Vietnamese to better comprehensive their history and heritage. 
let us in unity reserve our legacy and inspire our future. Thank you. Thay mặt cho Viện Bảo tàng Di sản Người Việt, trước tiên Châu Thị xin cảm ơn những sự đóng góp đâu dài trước đây của anh Tường Thái, có Thu Hà, có anh Trọng và tương lai chúng tôi sẽ mong đợi quý vị tiếp tục. Chính chúng ta là những người có bổn phận để gìn giữ và nói lên cái sự thật lịch sử, văn hóa và cái tinh thần nhân bản Việt Nam Cộng Hòa của chúng ta. Thành ra chúng tôi thiết tha, mong rằng quý vị ở đây là những người đến đây vì một ý nghĩa chung. Thì chúng tôi, chúng, tôi, chúng tôi mong đợi quý vị tiếp tục làm việc với chúng tôi. Xin cảm ơn. Well, Mr. Alex Tai has given us 30 minutes of the luxury of time. Um, so I'm going to say that we have about 20, 25 minutes for a discussion, and then we'll save some time for Thiem Hung to um, report back. All right, before we start, I know we always have a lot of questions, right? I can't reach to all, so, so please forgive me. I tend to, uh, to, to go with the one who raised their hands first, but I will try to prioritize those who have not spoken yet, all right? So uh, I'll go, but then I'll go with Kenneth first. <laughs> It's a, it's a real fast question. Sorry. It, I, I, I have so many questions. I'm sorry. So if you were to think of what artifacts today that we're living in in Vietnamese American society, 50 years from now, what do you think would be in a museum on our culture today? One more. Pass it, pass it. Um, very quick question. Um, in the museums here, are you preserving... Um, books, publications um, published in the South of Vietnam before 1975, um, and are you digitalizing these books and make it public for for everyone? Thank you. About the book, um, actually, I don't have much time. But right now, Vietnamese Heritage Museum has six different projects. The first one, we collect the artifacts. Uh, the, first, the biggest one we just got from fans is the boat that people escaped in 1984. The, the second project is we're doing auto history. It came out just like Ko Thanh Thuy. We, we're recording their life story and making it to the book. The third project is the two digital war that you've seen that we uh, dedicate for the people who uh, 165,000 people died in the refugee in the concentration camp, and then nearly a million Vietnamese old people died when they escaped. A fourth project we call um, 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 let me see literature collection. We collect up to now about 40, 50,000 thousand book. We collect. Uh, from Cố Đại sứ Bùi Diễm, mấy chục thùng gửi sang, rồi của giáo sư Nguyễn Văn Canh. Nói chung, we have thousands and thousands of books that we preserve and we continue digitize the information that we got. We got thousands and thousands of documents from before 1975, even up to when we, um, from people moving from north to south. So we have tremendous uh, document that we save. So answer your question, yes. We do have, have we try to collect as much, and then we, we people continue sending books from all over the world to us, even from Paris, that we collect and we preserve it now, yes. Do any of my, I can take some of my other um, I was just going to address the what would we um, know about or what would what material culture would be preserved and um, I, I just want to encourage all of you that are working on nonprofit advocacy work to uh, have a plan to archive your organizational records those are great insights into all of the labor uh, that you're doing now um, with the film fest with, uh, all of these pieces of um, of uh, uh, flyers and documents are going to be extremely important, I think, in, in the future. It documents the work that you all are doing. Something else to add to 
address the question of books. So we know that universities have much more resources than we do in the community. And if there is a, a Southeast Asia or Vietnam studies concentration, they'll often have books from that era. Um, but in terms of community-based spaces, I, Orange County has a Thu Vinh Viet Nam and Vinh Mik Hau. Um, Southeast Asian Archive also has a particular focus on Vietnamese writers um, and built that library collection based on donations from the community. So that means that, uh, for instance, uh, Nguyen Ngoc Bích from uh, the Virginia area, we've, uh, we've been working with his uh, widow to transfer uh, initially his entire library and then his papers to the Southeast Asian Archive. So partnerships with universities can be one means if that's the right path for you. But I'm not here as a representative of a university to um, encourage that. I actually think that we need to foster spaces of our own where we have more autonomy and control over how these collections are arranged and described and how we give access to these materials. So in order to do that, just like supporting the arts, we need to direct funding and resources to efforts in cultural heritage preservation. Um, I'd like to also answer Kenneth's question about what will we have in the museums 50 years from now to represent our community. Um, already, the artists that I showed you today, Ben Yen and Din Kule, their works are in major US ex uh, collections at the Smithsonian, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, um, so they already are already in the museum world, but um, my long-term project is also bringing artists who are working during South Vietnam, during the RVN period, because we have a very strong, active community of artists from that period that is not given attention to because of the omission and the erasure of that history and the destruction of artwork. And so in my dissertation work, um, I have been collecting and digitizing as many artworks as I can come across, and most of them are only existing in periodicals, and so I'm very interested in the collection of um, artistic journals, and so that is something that I have been doing, um, and I have had a lot of wonderful um, funding to do to travel to the Library of Congress, to the National Archives in the U.S., and then to go back to Vietnam, and I have been to every single possible, you know, National Archive that there exists in Vietnam, in Hanoi, in Ho Chi Minh City. I have gone to private libraries belonging to artists, um, collectors, gallerists. And so I came back from my research, from my dissertation, with uh, more than seven gigs of digitized um, documents. Oh, can, I, can I add one more? just want to answer Kenneth's question. It's so fascinating to me as an archaeologist to think about what um, the survival of objects and, and what people can um, kind of reconstruct, right, the narratives from those objects. And so I would choose, this is from my work with the Viet Museum in San Jose. Part of what we did was um, create this refugee, uh, Vietnamese refugee uh, archive exhibit because we didn't have that much time. I was leaving Stanford at the time when I was teaching there um, and we got some funding to digitize some of their materials but they had a huge holding, right? And so one of the exhibit that we had was called Crafting Survival and that was all of these materials um, that folks created in the re-education camps that then, some of them were then gifted to folks outside of the camps, right? So something I would preserve would be, for example, uh, a comb that was um, that was then whittled, right, from from uh, re it was from repurposed material. So it was from bomb shards that became a comb that was then engraved beautifully and intricately with these fine details. And there's an inscription on it that says. Tang Bae Kim, right, and a date on it of like 1976 or something like that, and and that you can trace back to the material. The material this is from a bomb shard that was then made from this refugee uh, from this re-education camp that was then gifted to someone else outside the camp that they decided was important enough for them to bring to the U.S. and it is now in San Jose, right? So the the life cycle of an object can tell powerful stories that can connect across borders and can tell histories about our community that goes beyond um, our resettlement in the U.S. Uh, I, I just want to answer Ken. Um, beside the museum that we collect artifacts, we have a lot of um, like video music. Um, uh, we even have some like những cái bản nhạc mà ngày xưa in sẵn từng tờ một. Thành ra talking about culture, yes, we do have a lot of you know artifacts and, and uh, video 
music, um, video um, from different like Twinga, Pari, Asia, and then even Goyi back to you know, 1975. And we have some uh, people donate some uh, film from before 1975 that we have in the museum. So, uh, so that's, that's what we got right here. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for all the job you do. It's very important because um, I myself witnessed uh, after 1975, the Horn collection book in my family were accused, labels, and burned down in front of my eyes. And my grandma somehow keep only three books left hiding behind the government. So though because of those three books, I, um, I was able to get away from being brainwashed. And those three books was like a textbook published before 1975. So that's telling me how important the job you are doing right now. And especially when we deal with the regime that tried to wipe out of the culture, the history, your job is very important because in the next future, they will go back to you where they can learn from the past and from the future. Now, I work from DC. I don't, uh, in DC, we don't have many Vietnamese, so I work mostly with the American museums. For the next, uh, in 2025, we will have exhibit. And I would like, after this, I, we, we don't have time, so I would like to get to connect with some of you for the exhibit and also what going on in DC because I would want to make again in Smithsonian when they mark the 40 years of the fall of Saigon, they have the beautiful exhibit for the Vietnamese people from the past, present, and the future. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I just noticed something, and, and I, I have learned so much, uh, especially about archiving. That's a wonderful work. And, but I noticed one thing about, I don't know how do you feel when, uh, this is nothing about archive, but it's just something that it hit me. Uh, our Vietnamese name has the accent. But at the beginning when we come here, we have to drop it because we don't have any way to record the accent on our name. However, it's going to be 50 years. So many, uh, uh, I don't know, technology have uh, you know, developed. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's Unicode on, uh, you know, electronically that we can put the accent on our Vietnamese name. But I still see our Vietnamese name doesn't have the accent. And to me, uh, even though I know I, I came here you know, when I was fairly old, but still, if I need to go look up a name, like I saw up here, Le Ming Dao, if I did not know that person is Le Ming Dao, and I taught my, ch my kid, L E La Le, Ming, and Yi, Y A R La Yao. So if that person go into the computer and look up someone, Le Ming Yao, and they will say it's Le Min Yao. And if they talk to any one of you about Le Min Yao, and you wonder, who's Le Min Yao? But they did not know it's supposed to say Le Min Dao because we did not put the right accent on the name. And so I'm just spoken for the little kid that if they would like to talk to us about an individual or even a... Um, a particular place like in Vietnam that I don't know a whole lot, I may not be able to say it properly if I did not know it. So I just wonder if we should make a, a, a habit, even in books, even on anything that we can write down. And, and I have noticed Dr. Truitt, in her books, all the Vietnamese name has all the proper accent. And I really appreciate what she did. And so I hope that, you know, from now on, we should preserve our name. Because I feel like I'm missing something when my name doesn't have the right accent. Yeah, so like I really just would like to make a comment. Thank I, you. I also want to just like reiterate that that is a very important issue and work that is being done right now in libraries um, to address that is an, a form of erasure, right? When we don't have the appropriate diacritic marks in our language, 
and how do you find the right information? It is fundamentally a problem of disappearance. And so um, the work, so I mentioned the word reparation. Um, in libraries, there's a term that's circulating now called reparative redescription. So it is about going back into the record, making sure that we're using the right diacritics in the Library of Congress database. They have something called a controlled vocabulary. So those are things like subject headings and you know, names of people and places and so on. So that work is being done. There are activists pushing for that kind of representation at that level of language. So thank you for pointing that out. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, I'm Erin Steinhauer from Vietnam Society. I'm actually in Washington, DC. So to the gentleman who thinks there's nothing happening in DC, there's actually a lot. We actually just finished uh, Vietnam Week uh, in DC where we held events at the Kennedy Center and various places. Last year, we actually had a big event at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of Asian Arts. Um, this is one of the most refreshing panels I have seen in the last few days. Thank you very much because it addresses the themes that came up throughout the last few days um, that I think really helps to unite us in a way that you know, we talked about how do we bring young people into the fold and really connect them with their roots. We talked about trauma and healing. We also talked about reconciliation. And I think art and culture plays a tremendous role in addressing all three. Um, art and culture has been used for many, many years, of course, to address healing from trauma. Uh, there are hundreds of cases all around the world for that post-conflict, also around reconciliation among former enemies, uh, as well as really um, bringing people together through shared values, traditions, through shared challenges and conflicts. So I, I, I think we all know that we have thousands of years of art and culture classic, modern, contemporary, not just Vietnamese Americans, but all around the world. You know, France has Vietnamese living there with creating amazing art, music, etc., cetera, uh, and in Vietnam. But also, I think that we all have a role to play in this community. You know, we talk about nước trở về nguồn, water goes back to its source, but what if people don't know where that source is? What if they don't know you know, or even worse, reject it, right? Like, you know, my source, what's that? Um, but we all have a role to play, not just the people on the panel here and academic and et cetera, or Kenneth or Vala, et cetera, but we all have a role to play in three ways. One, really creating space for um, presenting, uh, helping support programs and supporting exhibitions, et cetera, um, elected officials have an opportunity to help out in that, in that regard. So does the business community. Second, to really help um, encourage and support artists, right? They are the real struggling, starving artists, right? Really help them. And then third, uh, and lastly, to be passionate about it. You know, we can be so proud of all of the stuff that we have. Um, we are just as equal as Japanese art or Chinese art, right? That's why we do our programs at the Smithsonian and Kennedy Center, because we are right up there. Thank you very much. Um, okay, hello, thank you so much for this amazing panel. I am a deep admirer of all your works, and I wanted to say that, you know, when we think about this kind of reparative work, when we're thinking about the question of reclamation, these are intensely emotional labors, um, and oftentimes it falls on the shoulders of women um, who are doing this work of re recollecting, repiecing together things after destruction and safekeeping. So I just want to thank all of you for the care that each and every one of you take for this work and continue to help our community to build, build new kinds of vocabularies, right? So that we can name the kind of traumas that we have, we can name the kind of acts of resiliences, we can name the richness that come from our histories and we continue to create. So my question to you um, uh, is how do you, as 
individuals um, who are working towards a collective good manage the emotional labor that takes place um, in your kind of everyday work? Emotion, yes, because I escape when I receive some clothing from the children who what draw is emotion, and it brings back all my memory, you know, on my journey to freedom. But I overcome it. I wrote the book. I work on the museum just because I am survived. Many did not make it. So we are the voice for those voices. We have to do something so their sacrifice becomes some meaning. But yes, we do. I, when I see things I collect, people send it to me. I just talk to someone that, back there. We receive a handful of earth. One person escaped, normally they care about the food and water, but she carry a handful of earth just in case she die. She happy with her. You see emotion. I'm talking in emotion right now. But we need to keep it for our generation to learn that why they are here and why they have all this thing you know, around them easily. So yes, it is. Thank you. I want to thank An Tui, An Zhou Tui, for being vulnerable and sharing, you know, how emotional this work can be as as a memory keeper. But I also want to, and this is a provocation to everyone here, mm -hmm. to think about how we also can sometimes wield that weight of history as a way to discipline the next generation, right? How do we refrain from doing that, to not carry these hurts of history and these traumas that we hold in order to discipline our children to do things like achieve, right? Or um, to pay attention. Um, and, and of course, we want them to value this, uh, this work that we do, all of us here, um, all of us in the room. Of course, we want them to show up and care about these things, but I think when we use guilt um, or shaming, uh, it will tend to silence more than it involves and invites. So I also want us to be very cautious. When I was talking about sentiment, affect, feelings, what I mean is we harness that as a way to unify us, right? But we don't, and, and we become really aware of how the values that we place when we do work in the community or in our professional lives are weighted with those emotions in order to not carry that forward and guilt our, our children or our grandchildren, right? In order to, to stop that trauma from these cycles that perpetuate in our homes and in our community. Thank you, Tui. Uh, unfortunately, um, my boss just told me to, end, uh, to, to stop right now. So we would have to transfer it over to Tian Hung so that she can do the summary, all right? Okay. All right, this round table has been central in helping us think about and encounter liberatory memory work, remembering and commemoration in the lives of Vietnamese Americans. This work is not simply about telling your story, speaking of, and using your voice. This is political work. This work addresses the systematic conditions that make erasure, silencing, discrimination, and trauma possible in the first place. I'm in awe of the important political advocacy work that all panelists have done here uh, to capture and preserve in various modalities and to different types of, uh, in various modalities and to make them available in different, to different types of audiences within and beyond the Vietnamese American community. Their work uh, in capturing and preserving the narratives of lived experiences of Vietnamese Americans and to ensure that these memories, these narratives are sustainable for the long term. Uh, these presentations highlight the ethical, ethical task at hand. It is an urgent call for all of us to participate in this collaborative effort of memory work. Why? Because individual narratives of lived experiences are a part of the narrative of our collective survival, of a collective heritage and legacy being produced and perpetuated in the di diaspora. 
So no matter what our positionality may be, whether we're part of grassroots or history projects, art history uh, educator, professor in classics, or community activists advocating for the establishment of a Vietnamese heritage museum, we all can and should play a role in this liberatory memory work. So, Al Anh Dung, may I? Yeah, I'm doing sure. Vietnamese. Shall I? Thumb back? Okay. Gwen, I am conjuring you to do this. Thumb back? Thumb back bằng tiếng Việt. Lâu quá rồi, thuyết còn Gwen nói tiếng Việt. So, panel này, it's going to be a bit glitch, everybody. Get ready. Chúng tôi đã nói qua những công việc lưu trữ lịch sử và qua những không gian nghệ thuật, the potential. Tiềm năng. Tiềm năng để có thể um, chúng ta chống sự uh, tẩy xóa lịch sử của mình, uh, lịch sử Việt Nam Cộng Hòa và lịch sử uh, cộng đồng tị nạn. Uh, và lịch sử này rất là khó, mình có rất là nhiều khó khăn mà mình phải trải qua. Nhưng mà mình uh, các bạn trên panel này đã chứng minh là mình có những phương pháp để uh, đoàn kết, để có thể giúp nhau uh, tạo nên uh, không gian để... Uh, Collaborate. <laughs> Hợp tác. <laughs> Để hợp tác. Thank you very much. <laughs>